Good morning. If you take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Psalm, the book of Psalms, we will look at Psalm 25 this morning. Again, there's no insert through this series as we'd walk just through a few Psalms um, through this month. Um, and then we'll start a new series in September. Um, it's called P.I. Square. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, as we come along, but uh, so glad to see each of you here. Glad that you're, you've uh, you crawled out of bed. Uh, most of you probably showered and you cleaned up. You look good, and uh, glad that you're here. Glad that we can worship our God together. And uh, as school is back in session for some and is headed there, and college students are headed back soon, um, I just want to take a moment and thank publicly. Um, the two summer interns that we've had, uh, Marissa Smith, who is uh, now on her way. She's uh, down um, living in Columbus and has a, a Christian school that she's teaching at down there, uh, right outside of uh, Columbus near, uh, I think it's Marysville. Um, so you can be praying for her, but Marissa did an excellent job with our children's ministries again this summer. And then Aaron, Aaron Hesketh. Aaron, just stand and wave if you would. So Aaron, uh, we... Uh, he loves to be at the center and the limelight of everybody. Um, I should let him come up and preach. He would really love that. Actually, uh, poor Aaron. Aaron. Aaron loves to be in the background, and he has been such a tremendous help uh, with uh, the electronics and with our website. Uh, he's re redone our website. He, he's just helped with so many different things at the soundboard and with, uh, with our computers and the offices and uh, around the facility here. He has uh, increased uh, your bandwidth, so if you're on Wi-Fi now, you have quicker Wi-Fi thanks to Aaron, all right, and part of that was realizing we weren't getting what we were supposed to get, and so Aaron's just been a tremendous help in the office, and so uh, his last official day was Friday, um, but uh, we are so thankful for Aaron as he heads back down to Shawnee State, and as God continues to use him down by the Ohio River down there, you can be praying for him. Thanks, Aaron, for all your service and for your work. <laughs> psalm 25, I want to look at this psalm with you this morning. I want to walk through, and we're going to uh, not read it in its entirety first. We're actually going to just read it verse by verse. And I just want to walk through with you. There's, again, there's no outline um, one of the reasons why I didn't put anything in the bulletin for this month is I, I really wanted the freedom of the Spirit to move, and not that, the, not that the Spirit doesn't move when I do outlines. The Spirit just moves earlier in the week, all right? So um, uh, this morning, uh, I just want to share with you, this week, you ever have a dry week? You know, somebody asked me, how are you doing? And I said, I, I, I feel like the best word to describe it is dry. Anybody have a dry week before? You know what I'm talking about? Um, where you just feel like you're trying to accomplish things, but you don't see a whole lot taking place. And, uh, and that's, uh, I've had dry times in my time with the Lord, and where you sit down and you open your Bible and you read it, and you're like, okay, this is great, this is great reminders, thank you, Lord. Um, speak to me, I'm listening, and I'm here. And, uh, you know, the, for some of you, I know that to get up and to speak publicly, it would be torture anyway. It would be completely, you're like, no way. You know, God's gifted me to be able to speak. Uh, but one of the things as I grow older is I don't want to get up and speak from here and it just be me. I want God to speak. I want God to speak um, through me. And, and it is very um, intimidating and it's very difficult when you don't hear from God. And, and you know Sunday's still coming. I mean, Sunday all would come. It always comes for a preacher. I mean, it doesn't matter what happens in the week. You got to be ready for Sunday. And uh, just some time with the Lord in these last few mornings, uh, especially, I just, um, I said, Lord, I, 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 don't, I don't know what you want me to share. And so uh, there's a psalm that we're going to walk through this morning. And there's some thoughts that I have that I want to share with you as God uh, spoke to me, and, and I hope that that's what God desires for me to share with you, because that's what I'm going to share. Now, if we get halfway through this and God says something else, then we'll go with that, all right? But, uh, uh, but again, my intention and my prayer uh, is not for me just to get up and for you to hear a good sermon and, and, 
or maybe a bad one and say, well, that wasn't his best, and you go on your way, and you have your week, and you do your thing. Um, my desire, my prayer is that we will see God show up today and that God will work in us because I need that and you need that. You need God showing up in your life and in today in this place. And that's my prayer. So before we dig in, how about we ask the Lord's help for that, all right? Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you are awesome, that you, that you listen to us, that you, you're always there. You never sleep. You don't slumber. You don't take a day off. Lord, you are a constant. And Lord, I, I thank you that we have this great privilege of gathering together as followers of Jesus to come and lift up our, our, our praise, to lift up our voices, um, Lord, to, to lift up our hearts, to ask you to come and to speak to us. And Lord, what a privilege it is to know that, that we're not alone as individuals, but together the body of Christ many members seeking to honor you, seeking to use the gifts and the abilities that you've given to each one of us for the purpose of glorifying you, for the purpose of proclaiming your goodness, proclaiming salvation to a lost and dying world. Lord, what a privilege you've given us as your children, Lord, to live for you. Lord, as we walk through this psalm this morning, I pray that that your spirit would use your word um, to penetrate our hearts. Help, it, help us to see things that maybe we would not have seen before. Help us to see areas of our own heart and our own life where, where we need you to work in. Lord, this is not about me. It's not about even us. It, it's about you, and it's about meeting with you and desiring to have, have you come and speak to us and have your spirit, giving your spirit the freedom to work in us and to mold us and to make us more like your son, Jesus Christ. We can't do that. We can't muster enough strength or enough passion in and by ourselves. And so, Lord, we need you. We need you. We're desperate. And Lord, your word tells us that, that desperate people who come to you who humble themselves, you will lift up. You will respond to them. You will listen to them. You will bless them. And so, Lord, we come as needy people, sinners. Lord, if there's sin in our lives, Lord, if there are people that sit here this morning who know that they've been in opposition of you, rebellion against you and your ways, and yet they're a child of yours, I pray that now, Lord, now that they would turn from their sin, they would repent from it, knowing that you are a great and gracious God who loves us, who's willing to forgive us, who casts our sin as far as the west is from the east. Thank you, Lord, for that. Thank you for the way you've demonstrated your love that while we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. We know that we can come boldly, we share all of this boldly before your throne because of Christ. And so we pray that you would hear us, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Psalm 25. Uh, before we dig in, uh, just kind of this thought as I was kind of thinking about this, this psalm and what a, the overarching uh, kind of theme of this psalm. Um, back just a couple years ago down at Skyview Ranch, which uh, if, if you want to be a part of our Skyview Ranch, we'd love for you to come and be a part of that weekend. Uh, and if you don't know anything about it, just talk to my bride. Uh, she's got it all organized and well-planned. Um, but we would love for you to join us for that weekend uh, family time at Skyview. Skyview Ranch is down in Millersburg, Ohio, and, and it's a, a ranch, and it's a camp, 
And uh, part of their property on the hillside, there was one day where um, the staff were out walking around and they realized they saw some bees and they saw these bees and they saw a group of them. And as they started to explore a little bit farther, they found uh, this hole uh, in, in the side of a hill. And, uh, and as they explored more, they realized this was a big beehive and not yellow jackets, but an b- actual beehive. And so they called some people in, and uh, this beekeeper, and they came in, and they actually dug away some of the dirt, and inside they found this huge, huge uh, bee's home, and uh, the, the, the comb and the honey and everything that, that they took out uh, was underground. You, could, you couldn't see it. People were walking by it all the time. We still... Uh, I said, did anybody get stung during that time? They said, no, nobody got stung. It was the weirdest thing. And yet here were these thousands and thousands of bees uh, that kids walked by all the time and, and, and nobody got stung that we know of. But underground was this fortress of, of, of bees and honey. And, and, and I think of that when we think of this psalm and we think of our lives, I, I want you to think about what's going on underneath. What's going on inside of you? Uh, the part where people can't see, or people, a lot of people in your life, they might not be able to, to look at and locate, but what's going on underground? What's going on in your heart, in your soul? Uh, the question that I've kind of thrown out here is, who, who is your God, and do you trust Him? I'm trusting that he'll give me the word this morning to share with you. Uh, As we walk through this psalm, what's going on underground in your life? Let's look at this. Um, This is a psalm of David. And actually, a little background, if we were reading this in Hebrew, you would see that each uh, stanza of this song, each, each line would start with the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet. And so we, we, we lose that in our translation. But the psalmist here used very specific words as he walked through the Hebrew alphabet. And as he started each line, each line starts with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And it goes in chronological order. Really neat thing. If I knew Hebrew really, really well, I would have that up on the screen and walk you through that. I'm not a Hebrew scholar, all right? about Hebrew, it's very difficult. Also, you read it from right to left. Uh, I have trouble reading left to right, top down. Um, So, um, but it is neat to think about that there is, there is a lot of thought. There's a lot of, again, God leading as we walk through this. uh, In a way, this is poetry. It's a song that's, that David has, has put together. And so, there's real meaning and intention here as we walk through this. So the Psalm of David, it says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In my God, in you I trust. Um, To stop and think about, again, sometimes we quickly walk over these words. So so number one, um, to you, O Lord. That word Lord in Hebrew means Yahweh. And and the Hebrew, uh, the the Jewish nation, they would... uh, especially in the Old Testament times, they would not even say um, this word because they knew God was so holy. He was so above them. He was so righteous in all his glory that, that they feared of speaking his name. And so when, when, when David is writing this, he's going to use a couple of different words um, that we, we see Lord and God, but as we translate them from Hebrew, we see Yahweh, uh, the one who is exalted, the one is that who is above all. And when they would write it, they would take out the vowels. So they didn't even have vowels in this because God was so high and so mighty. And so the psalmist, David, is starting here. He says, to you, O Lord, you, you are my audience. I, I am talking to you. I'm singing to you. To you, O Lord, I lift up my what? What does he say here? My soul, my inmost being. And this is where I'm talking about with the bee story. What's going on underground? What is your inmost part of who you are? What is the one part of you that will continue living even after your body dies? It's your soul. 
It's who you are. It makes up who you are. The psalmist is saying, you, God, I lift up my inmost being to you. And then he goes on, verse 2, it says, oh, my God. Uh, This word God is Elohim. This is the first mention of who God is in Genesis 1 when when God created the heavens and the earth. This Elohim, the the creator God, the one who who is the triune God. When God says, uh, let us make man in our image. Uh, There's a reference, there's there's a connection when you start connecting the dots from the Old Testament to the New Testament where this uh, Elohim is not just a, a singular but a plural God, the Godhead. This is God, Lord, not, not that you're just high and mighty but that you, that, that you are the triune God that's created us in your image and who has given us, you are the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So, oh my God, Elohim, uh, in you I trust. Uh, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of different times where it's fun to play trust games. Um, Every once in a while, my son, um, back a few months ago especially, was uh, playing this trust game where he would like just stand there and say, trust fall, and he would fall backwards and like out of the nowhere, like you're we just got up from the dinner table, and we're taking our plates into the kitchen. We put them in there, and we walk back, trust fall. It's like, it's like that. You can't do that, Zach. And one time I missed him, and he's like, what do you do? You're supposed to, I'm supposed to trust you. And it's like, you, you can't do that. And, you know, there's these fun games where, uh, where you, can, you can do that kind of thing. And at camp, I remember um, we, would, we would have that where you'd stand, you'd stand up on the stump and your cabin would line up the, on the sides and, and they would all interlock arms and you would put your arms across and you'd fall back and they were, they were to catch you. And I remember one boy in our cabin, we weren't ready and he just fell and the poor kid fell on the ground. <laughs> And it was awful because it's like, man, he's like, I'm not going to trust you and I'm not going to trust God. And, you know, it's like, ah, oh, like that illustration failed badly. You know, I think for us as followers of Christ, and I just want to pause for a second. If you're not a follower of Christ, if you haven't trusted Christ as your Savior, I want to encourage you. Jesus loves you. He gave his life for you. And he wants you to have a relationship with him. He invites you to have a relationship with him. And so when I share about a follower of Christ, it's those who, who have um, placed their faith in Jesus, that Jesus died, he was buried, and that he rose again three days later uh, to take away our sin. And we, as sinners, acknowledge our need of a Savior, and Jesus paid that penalty. And so we ask him to forgive us of our sin and come into our life, and, and we, we trust him for, eternal, for an eternal relationship. So as followers of Christ, when we think about trust, uh, we think about the trust of trusting Jesus as our Savior, but how does this display in our normal everyday life? And that's why I'm asking, go a little bit deeper. Get, a, get below what you already know. Get below that head knowledge. Okay, I know I have to trust God. I had a really interesting conversation with my daughter this week, um, Marissa. We were in the vehicle, and I was just kind of sharing with her some of my heart and, and what was going on and, and during the week. And we had just gone to the dentist, and I, y- yes, I despise, not my dentist. My dentists are great people, um, great people. I love them so much. But that place... There is something about that drill. I think there are going to be those drills in, in hell. I really believe that. <laughs> and anytime I hear that high-pitched noise, it's like, and it's like, oh. We were at the dentist, realizing once again, nobody else has cavities except for who? Yes, father does. Who always gets the kids to brush their teeth at night and do all that, blah, blah, blah. Anyway. It's not that I had a cavity and I had to hear the grief from my kids and my wife again, but the fact that, that here is this bill. Okay, Aaron, this is what you have to have done. And so I'm looking at this bill thinking, okay, and I asked them, I said, so how much do I have left to pay for Lene's braces? Uh, and they told me the amount. I'm like, all right, so I'm adding that up. I'm walking out to the vehicle, and I realize once again, I'm looking at, of course, all of this just hits you at once. Look at my vehicle and say, all right, 
winter's coming, summer's about done, these two tires are about bald. I'm going to need two tires. What's two tires cost? Well, of course, they're not little tiny tires. They're big tires. So I'm thinking in my mind, estimating. And so Marissa and I are driving along, and all this is going on in my mind, and we're just having a, a conversation. She's just really just listening. And, uh, and, and I said, I know I should just share different things. And I said, I know I need to trust God, but it's hard because I don't know where all this goes. I said, I, I try and I try and I try, Marissa. Mom and I try to work hard on, on budgeting and putting money away. And I said, I feel like every time we get right where we want to be or where we're headed, there's something else. And she just smiled at me. And, and, and Marissa just looked at me and she just said, Dad, that, you just have to trust God. And I said, I know, Marissa, but, you know, then I think about we're going to have college soon and, you know, how am I going to pay for college? I got, I got two years and she just started laughing. And she's like, Dad, you're supposed to trust God. And I said, yeah, and then I think about retirement and I'm not putting enough away for retirement. <laughs> and she hit me and she said, Dad, stop. I said, I know, but I'm just giving you some insight to how my, my brain works and how... Please tell me that you, you can understand what I'm saying. Can you understand? Uh, it may not be, it may not have started at the dentist office, but something somewhere in your life, you are wrestling with this idea of, do I really trust God? I, I think it's a daily struggle. It's a daily chore for us. It's easy for me to say, I, I trust God. It's another thing to say, God Elohim, the one who has provided all that I need, who has given me great joy through Jesus and my Savior. Oh, Elohim, I trust you. It's easy to say, but yet we see in the next part of this verse, it says, oh my God, Elohim, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. I don't want to be a dad who, who's greatly in debt and who has to, has to have great financial issues. I don't want to be a dad who can't provide for, for his children to get an education. I don't want to be a dad who, who, or a father or a husband one day who has to sit back and, 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 and can't provide for my wife. See, that's where the shame comes into play. That's where the, the, the problems come into play as we start learning and working through trust. It's an issue that, about ourselves that comes deep within the shame of what others are going to think, the shame of what those who we love the most that are closest to us, what are they going to think? How are they going to respond? If I fail, if I make a mistake, what's going to happen? And see, the problem is not a trust in God. It's a problem of trusting that I'll provide, a trusting that I can do it right, a trusting that, that I have to figure it all out. And that's not what the psalmist says. The psalmist says, oh my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exult over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. Uh, notice the verbiage there. What's the action verb? None who wait. Are you good at waiting? Uh, I, I think we all struggle and wrestle with that, and, and that's a, again, a continual life learning process. When we wait upon God, this promise is something that we've got to take with us. When you struggle with trust, run to this verse. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. That doesn't mean that we just sit back and that we just say, okay, God, you do it all. No, we are an interactive part with God. We are interacting, actively pursuing God as He is working. Not me manipulating and controlling the steering wheel, but allowing Him to take the wheel and run with it, and I am right there in the vehicle with Him and doing as He desires for me to do. I am active. Waiting here is not some passive form. It is an active uh, aspect of our lives that we that we consciously and, and and purposefully wait upon God as you came in this morning you don't know this but but I prayed for you I, I sat at the chairs that were by this door and I said Lord I know that in a few moments that, that people are going to walk through these doors 
And I said, Lord, that intimidates me in some ways because you're telling me I got to have a word and I don't know if I have the right word. And, and God said, wait on me. We wait. Uh, a, a waiter or a waitress comes to the service of, of the people that they're serving. As we wait upon God, we come to him and we say, Lord, what is it that you are doing around me? What is it that you are desiring from me? How how do you want me to respond? How do you want me to act? How do you want me to think? What is this that you desire for me? That's waiting. That's acknowledging God, uh, Lord, above all, Elohim, God, you, you are creator. You have all of this universe in your control. And to know that the promise that if I wait, that I will not be put to shame. I might be humble. God may humble me, but I will not, and you will not be put to shame. It's verse 3, the end of it. They shall be ashamed who are wantous, wantonly treacherous. Wantonly treacherous. And when I was looking this up, I had to relook it up again this morning. This is, this is, this is somebody who purposefully uh, moves away or acknowledges deceit, acknowledges uh, and has a purpose, desire, and ultimately our context here, a, the purposefully moving away from God and doing what is wrong. Hopefully you're not that. Maybe you are. Here's the promise. They will be ashamed. Those people will live in shame. But for those who wait upon God, we don't have to be ashamed. And we, we can walk around secure and who we are, that we're his children, and that God will provide and he will protect when we place our trust in him and not ourselves. Verse 4 says, Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Now here's some action now. In this part of the psalm, uh, there's, there, there's some direct action that, that, that David is asking God to do. The first one is to do this, make me know your ways. So maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you need to ask God, Lord, I don't know what way it is, and I need you to make it clear to me what is your way. One of the great things about memorizing God's word is God recalls, brings that to our recollection as we walk throughout our day. To make us know his way is a great prayer. Lord, make me know your way because I want to be in step with you. Teach me your paths. What lights the path? Later on in the Psalms, uh, the Psalm uh, says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So how can we know God's path? His word, to read it and study it and and yet, as I told you earlier, sometimes we read it and sometimes we're, we're in it and we've had it memorized or we're memorizing it and sometimes we still feel dry. We still feel like, like God, where are you? What, what's going on? And, and that's where the waiting comes in, where we have to actively keep searching the truth. But then verse 5 says, lead me. And we have to trust God will lead us in his truth. Lead me in your truth and teach me. I know God's teaching me, and, and I love the way he's teaching me. He's, he's patient. He's so kind to me. He's gentle. I think I would have hit myself up alongside of the head with a two-by-four a long time ago, all right, especially this week, all right? Thankful for a daughter that just laughed at me instead of hitting me, all right? Um, but here is God saying, the psalmist David saying to God, lead me in your truth, and then notice what he says, for you are the God of my salvation. Is God the one who has saved you? Has God brought salvation to your life? If he's brought salvation to our lives, is there anything more that we really need? That's a question we have to ponder and we have to dig deep about. Because I don't know if I could always answer, no, I don't need anything more. Because my heart is deceitful and wicked. And sometimes my eyes get off the one 
whom I should trust. And that's why the psalmist says here, for you I wait all the day long. How long would you wait for God? How long would you wait to hear from Him? If you're in a dry land right now, how long would you sit and wait? We are impatient people. We are people on the go. We live in a, in a world and communities that are always going. In order to, to feel productive and to feel um, like we're accomplishing something or that we're keeping up with what we feel is right, waiting is not part of that. And yet David is saying, I'll wait for you all day. Verse 6, David will use this word remember multiple times now. It says, remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Again, the Yahweh here in verse 4 and in verse 6, remember your mercy, O Lord. Verse 7, remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For the sake of your goodness, O oh Lord. Three times he uses this word remember. Remember your mercy. Remember not my sin. And remember me. Yahweh. Yahweh. The book ends. The one who is so much higher and mightier than me. God, would you remember me? Verse 8, good and upright is the Lord, Yahweh. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right, and he teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimony. What's interesting, before we, we were looking at his ways and uh, David's asking God, teach me your paths. And then it's almost like he answers uh, this question that isn't asked. What, what is the right path? What are the paths? The path of the Lord is this in verse, 10, in verse 10. The paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his testimonies. As we listen to the word and as we learn from God, we, we're called um, to abide in His love, abide in Him, and be faithful. It doesn't say that you need to be successful. It doesn't say that you need to be fruitful even. There's this concept that I think that we've, we've brought from the outside world and we've brought it into church that ultimately, unless you are bearing fruit, you're, you're not doing something right. And while if we are faithful to God, God promises us that he will bear fruit in us, we cannot and should not muster enough energy and strength or whatever knowledge or wisdom or whatever we can process to think that we can bear fruit. Because when we start bearing fruit in and of ourselves, that's some ugly fruit. And it's fruit that's not going to last. And the psalmist helps us to understand that it's about faithfulness. It's about you and me being faithful to God and what He has instructed us to be faithful to, to what He's called us to do and to rely upon Him that as He directs that path, He will make the future known. I don't have to worry about it because He's been faithful in the past, He's faithful now, and He will be faithful in the future. And do you believe that? Is that your God? And do you trust Him? Verse 11, he uses this, this, uh, this phrase, for your name's sake, O Yahweh, because your name is above all, because I want your name to be exalted. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. This is a man who is called a man after God's own heart. This is a man, while we remember David and Bathsheba uh, or David and Goliath, this is a man who, who loved God with all of his heart. 
And while he fell and had times of, of hardship and struggle, this is a man who is faithful to God, who God used in great ways. And this is a man who comes to the Lord and says, pardon my guilt because it's great. You're feeling overwhelmed with your sin. You're feeling so guilty. Bring it to God. And I love that word pardoned because that means it's cleared, it's wiped away. It's like it's never happened. Come to me, God says, and I, I will forgive you. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Verse 12. Who is the man who fears the Lord? God will he instruct. He will instruct him in the way that he should choose. His soul shall abide in well-being, and his offspring shall inherit the land. The friendship or the intimacy, the counsel of the Lord is for those who fear him. If you want to know who God is and what he wants for your life, it takes friendship, it takes intimacy, it takes time, it takes a willingness and a wanting to say, God, you are the priority of my life. And everything else revolves around that. It isn't God's my first priority and then my second priority and then my third priority. God is the priority. God is the one who I seek the intimacy there for those who fear him. And he makes known to them his covenant. He reminds them his promises. Verse 15, my eyes are ever toward the Lord for he will pluck my feet out of the net. Whenever we see this phrase, uh, there's multiple times in the Psalms and also in Proverbs where, where there's a net, and that netting is often used in a negative way for those who, who are in the, the world and trying to deceive people and to rebel against God. And, and it's great because David is saying here, if my eyes are towards the Lord, he will deliver me from that. He's going to pluck my feet from it. He's going to guide me in the path, in the direction that he wants me. Verse 16, turn to me and be gracious to me. He's pleading with God. Look at me. Please show your grace for I am lonely and afflicted. I wonder how many people are feeling lonely today. Plead to God. Verse 17, the troubles of my heart are enlarged. It doesn't say his heart is enlarged. It says his troubles are enlarged. The troubles of my heart, that, that is dearest to me, seem overwhelming. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction, verse 18, and my trouble, and forgive all my sins. Verse 19, consider how many are my foes, and with, with what violent hatred they hate me. Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. That reference to the very thing that he started in the beginning, that I lift up my soul, here it is, and now he's saying, I need you to guard it. Because it's in danger and it's in jeopardy. Please, guard my soul, deliver me. Because there's a lot of different paths that I could take. Let me not be put to shame. For I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me. For I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all of his troubles. Where's your joy? Where's your peace? Are you content? Where is your deliverance? Where are you looking to, to provide for you some security some peace, some rest. Who are you turning to? Let me encourage you. There's only one who can provide what your soul needs and what you hunger for. To walk through those struggles this week and to then come before God to acknowledge and say, God, I can't do anything about the future because I don't know what it looks like. Give me wisdom. Help me to do what's right. Give me a knowledge so that I can do and act and say the way you want me to. But God, I'm not going to worry about that because I've got to trust you. 
What's going on underneath the ground in your life? Are you trusting God? You struggle with waiting? Having those wrestling matches with God? I want to encourage you. There is no one like him. He's our God. And he loves you and he loves me. And he desires for us to walk with him. So let me encourage you to do that this week. Will you pray with me? Lord, thanks for your word. Thank you for the truths of your word. Thank you that that we can walk through a psalm that acknowledges um, King David as he has written it, the psalm of dedication, a, a, a psalm of proclamation, uh, of proclaiming who you are, a, a psalm uh, and a song that cries out in desperate pleas. Lord, it's much it's much of where we are today as, as individuals, but as a church too. Lord, we desire to be obedient to you. We want to know your way and your path. We want to be obedient to you, knowing that you are a God who will not put to shame those who trust and wait upon you. And so help us to do that. Help us not use earthly means to try to come up with a formula or a plan. But may it be truly said that our cornerstone, the rock that we go back to every day, every time we wrestle with doubt, with fear, with shame, that Christ the one who has provided salvation, the one who gives us hope, who gives us life, the one we owe all of our life to, may that be the one that we run to, the refuge, the hope, our Savior. May we be people who are faithful this week, And if there are people that need to repent of their sin and turn from their sin, Lord, do your work in us. Purify us. Make us holy for your glory, for your name's sake, for your glory, and so that the world may see that you are an awesome God. We need your help, Lord. We're desperate people. May we stay desperate waiting for you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.